here we are back at the machine with a cat in my chair as usual. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. Okay. So for joining on the machine, um, one of the things that gets a little tricky is getting that tension correct. And you can always auto tension um, and knit, it, knit the row by hand. Uh, just to make sure that your loops are big enough because you really want to do this as like a latch tool bind off you knit one row and then just use your latch tool to put it together um, in this case because I used a double strand of this yarn I'm going to do my join with just a single strand on a tension 10 because normally with a single strand in this yarn I'd be knitting at a tension 1 so I should be just fine to do it this way. All right. Now, as I said, I'm going to do my seams on the outside rather than on the inside, which is traditional. Um, I like to have something that's a little fun and funky. And this, this little touch will do that for me. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to put the two layers of my fabric together. I'm going to use my three prong tool. Um, you can use the two prong, you can use the one prong if that's what you're comfortable with. But I like to follow hand knitting rules when it comes to joining rows together, which is where you pick up three stitches and you skip one. Pick up three, skip one all the way down because your stitch is different than your row. Um, that width is, is different. So I'm just gonna use the three prong tool to go through both layers of the fabric I'm going to wiggle in and then I'm just going to hang those three. Now you can do this one side at a time. If it's easier for you to pick up one layer and then pick up the next layer, then do it that way. Okay. Um, I do it this way because I find that it ends up more even. You don't end up with um, extra stitches on one side that you didn't have on the other. So you don't end up with some weird uh, overlap. And sometimes you can knit it that way. I sometimes will knit my back longer than my front on purpose. Um, and then I just start at the sleeve and work my way down. And wherever that bottom falls, I'm pretty darn happy. Um, so I'm just going to work my way down here. And I use the three pr the, the prong tools because that helps you keep even. Um, because the prong tools are already situated for the width of your bed uh you're not picking up stitches that are too close together get through there you're always nice and evenly spaced which is important on something like this because if you're going to do a seam on the outside you want it to look nice and neat and and kind of put together as it were so that's that's kind of what we're doing here so we're just i'm just working my way down and when I get to the underarm, I'm going to do some uh, calisthenics with that. I'm going to do some stretching, and we're going to maneuver it around and make it work. Because as I said before, you know, yarn doesn't judge, and it doesn't have a memory. And I, I mean that not in the sense that, you know, wool has more elasticity and wool has memory, or that, you know, alpaca has no memory. I mean that if you knit a piece and you take it apart, the yarn doesn't remember, literally doesn't remember. Um, it, it doesn't, it's not going to judge you because you made a mistake. Learning to fix your mistakes is the most empowering thing you can learn, um, in my opinion. Um, I, I actually teach a fix your mistakes class for hand knitters simply because... I find a lot of hand knitters that have been knitting for 30, 40 years who still don't know how to fix their knitting. They'll tear a whole piece out because they don't know how to fix it. And to me, that's, it's inhibiting. It's, it's one of those things that should be taught from the very beginning. You should know how to pick up a drop stitch the day that you pick up needles. Um, and the same thing on a knitting machine, you know, the day that you run, start running a carriage, you should be learning why the, you get loops on the edge, how to fix those, how to deal with it, how to rip out a row, if that's what you need to do, how to reset your punch card because you ripped out a row, 
um, and how to pick up a drop stitch. They're not rocket science. They're really not. I know it seems like it sometimes. Um, but sometimes, and I tell hand knitters this all the time, knit a swatch and make mistakes. Do it just on a swatch. You know, use 25 yards of a, of a cheap yarn that you're not going to care about if you throw away later. Um, but, you know, knit a swatch. Knit 30 rows by, by 30 stitches and drop a stitch on purpose. Because it's not happening in the middle of a project, it's much easier for you as the knitter to analyze what is going on because you're not going to get as frustrated. It's not going to feel like you've made this huge mistake because it's just a swatch. You know, who cares about a swatch? You know, learn, learn to do cables in a swatch. Learn to use a punch card in a swatch. Learn how to read a punch card while you're swatching. You can figure it out. You just have to pay attention to the details. One of the biggest things to learn and to understand is what will block out and what won't. There are things that can be fixed with blocking. Um, and here in the States, we have a saying that shit will block right out. Um, and it's a good one because I use it all the time. <laughs> When people bring me something and they're like, oh, I made this mistake and this is what happened and this is what it looks like. And I'm like, honey, just keep going. That'll block right out. Okay, that's fixable and blocking. Or I can say, you know what, we can fix that and we don't have to frog. Um, frogging being when you rip rip out rip, rip out your yarn. Um, it's, it's so termed because of the sound that it makes um, where you rip it, rip it. Very similar to rib it, rib it. Now I'm kind of just checking to make sure that everything is going to line up appropriately and it looks like my back might be a smidge longer than my front or vice versa. I'm not really sure which direction I have them going here because um, my underarm doesn't quite come together in the right place, but I can fix that. So if you see that you're off ever so slightly, find the point where you're off. So at my underarm, I noticed that I may have um, some discrepancies. So I'm going to put my underarm down here, which stretches these out and allows me to get it in there. Now, I may have to move those. I may have more stitches here than what the stretch gives me, so to speak. But what I notice is that the front side of this is stretched much more than the back. Um, so I kind of want to deal with that discrepancy and make sure that everybody kind of stays lined up um, and what that means is I'll kind of automatically skip a little bit on that back section because it's going to bunch up just a smidge and the trick is to time where you're bunching up so if I'm grabbing the first stitch on the front and the second stitch on the back I'll do that on one pickup and then on the next pickup I'll make sure that they're aligned until everything is aligned um, it's kind of like what you do with mattress stitch where you might pick up one stitch from one side but two stitches from the other side um, and that's how you uh, you get everything to line up but you can't you have to spread those those discrepancies out otherwise you end up with puckering and you don't want puckering um, or maybe you do um, I've done puckering on purpose but for the most part you probably don't want puckering in your seams and this is no no difference here. I, I don't want puckering and I certainly don't want puckering in my underarm because um, that's going to be really uncomfortable. That, that is a place where I don't particularly like big bulky seams. All right, so it actually looks like I'm going to end up not moving those underarm stitches. They're going to stay right where they're at. Not lined up. Just perfect. All right, so I've already picked up my underarm stitches, although I'm a little high on that one. Those two right there, a little bit high. And then I don't want them to be high. I want them to be nicely on the edge. So 
So now I'm at the bind off for the underarm. These stitches are way easier to pick up because you've kind of got this natural little space where your tool wants to go. We just want to make sure that we stay right on that edge and don't do anything funny. Stick in there. See, you can bend down. All the way down. And I'm going to pick up every stitch here. I'm not going to skip anybody because what I'm actually picking up is the gap that is created by the around the gate peg bind off. So I'm using those holes from the bind off to do this. And if I've done it right, I'll have the same amount of stitches on both, <laughs> both pieces. And if I haven't done it right, then I can fudge it. It looks like I might be in a pretty good place here. All right, this last one. So what did I end up with here? I've got 60 on that side and 61. Hey, I didn't even plan that. So 121 stitches is what I have for my entire side seam. So that's not really that bad. Um, I like knitting in a slightly larger gauge. So now I'm just going to knit one row. And like I said, I went from a doubled strand to a single strand. And I'm on a tension 10 because with a single strand on 10, this is nice and loose. And that's precisely what I want. Because you don't want to bunch up your edge. And this is pretty much always, always a hard knit. And I've got somebody stuck. So I'm going to pop my top and go through. Okay, so if that happens, just open up your carriage. Um, or for the brother users, you guys have that really handy release that you can use. Pull back to the needle in question, and it's this one right here. It got a little jammed up in itself. Ooh, I got a dodgy latch. It's inside. So we're just going to pop that guy open. We'll bring him forward. And just check his neighbor. His neighbor looks like she had a problem, too. Okay. So I can hand knit what's left here. And it's just a handful of stitches. No biggie. I can do that. Just make sure that your latch is actually closed before you get back to the fabric. So you can manually close that latch. And it works out really, really well. And if you needed a bigger stitch to do this, you can always do the whole thing by hand just like this. Um, I like to have the yarn in the carriage when I do it by hand. Um, because it provides me with some tension going that way as opposed to uh, no tension or, or going above you into the mast. Alright, so latch tool. One loop through the next loop all the way down the side. And I'll deal with my tails later. do this because there are no live stitches really I like to take a look and make sure that I've gotten everybody fairly well so just run your finger along the back of the seam and make sure there are no gaps in it and you haven't missed one of your edges but that's a that's a pretty nice I do say so myself I like outside seams um, they make me happy it is what it is if you don't like this, it's okay. Do the exact same thing on the inside, and you'll have this on the inside. And you can actually press it to lay one way or the other. Um, it looks very similar to the, the very narrow style of seam that you get with mattress stitch. 
So if you were to do this on the inside, it, it wouldn't be any bigger than what you'd get on Natural Stitch. Um, but this is obviously much faster. <laughs> so now we're gonna do the other side. Let's figure out front and back real quick. Back's got the higher collar. So let's see. Oh, right here. So that neckline almost matches the neckline that I've got on, but I think I will, in fact, put a a fold over neckline on this. Um, other than that, the length is quite good. The sleeves are actually great. Um, I like this kind of dip that's happening here. Um, I'm very happy with that. So I think that's all good. It's still a little baggy, a little big on me, um, but that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm quite pleased with this piece. So yes, yeah, well I'm just going to finish that neckline and we'll come back for that. Thank you. 